if the only gospel we had, if the only words of Jesus that we had were this one parable, it would be enough to understand God's ways with us. Because it's completely counterintuitive to what we would expect, or rather, it's counterintuitive because it's contrary to what we would do and the way we would behave, and somehow we project that onto God, thinking that God is like us. That's why God says in one of the Psalms, Psalm 50, so you think I'm like you? Really? So that's why we need the gospel to show us who God really is. Hopefully we can receive it. So here we have the story of the younger son who says, you know, give me my inheritance. Uh, it's, you know, God the Father and we are the children. We share the inheritance, as Paul says. In fact, if you actually look at the Greek here, it says, doesn't, don't give me the share of the money or the property. It says, give me the share of being. Maybe the English word substance, give me your substance, you know, gets that somehow. But it's actually usia, the, give me the being that I, you know, give me your being. And so the father divides his life. It's literally the word, bios. He divides his life. He gives his life, his substance, his very being. That's, that's what our inheritance really is. We're sharing the very life of God. You know, the father, any father shares his life, his being, in a sense, with his children, but we literally share the divine being. So that's, that's what we can squander more than any kind of money or property is, you know, ident our identity, which the son does squander. He squanders his life, as it says, you know. And when he comes back to himself, which is literally what's said, comes to his senses, comes back to himself and realizes, oh, my father's hired servants have more to, are doing better than I am, so I'm going to repent and go back. And some people think he was just, you know, how can I best worm my way back into, no, into my father's affection? I think he really was repentant, you know, that he saw, you know, Father, I'm no longer, I've sinned against heaven, against you. I know I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, which was true, by human standards anyway. Make me one of your hired servants. So he goes off and he, he be, begins to say his speech. He doesn't even finish it because the father is so quick to leap upon him and kiss him and embrace him and put on the best robe and the sandals and the ring and everything. It, totally contrary to what we would expect. You know, we would expect, and what we, the way we would treat someone is, well, okay, you came back, so now, you know, spend five months as my hired servant, or approve yourself by being faithful for six months, or you know, pay back, you know, what you stole or went away with and squandered, and something like that, you know, retributive justice, as Richard War would say, instead of restorative justice. You want to restore the person to the dignity and the joy and the peace that he had. And that's all the father cares about, you know. Uh, so we, when we talk, talk about, you know, having to make satisfaction, you know, we have to make satisfaction for our sins. We have to do penance for our sins. We have to show that we're really, no. God, uh, Father doesn't say, make satisfaction for your, and then I'll take you back, you know. We project all this nonsense onto God. What really converts us, what really astonishes us, what really changes us is his mercy, which knows no bounds and no conditions. All we've got to do is present ourselves precisely in our poverty, and God receives us, not just receives us back, but he leaps on us and kisses us and embraces us and clothes us with divine dignity, you know, the, the robe, the ring, the, the child of God, you know, restores us completely. That's the good news. That's why I say all we would need of this is one parable to show who God really is, you know, and how God deals with us. And it's so counterintuitive. The proof of which is the older brother. We had to include the older brother in the parables because that's the way we would behave. <laughs> that's the way we would react, you know. Uh, we, dis you know we separate ourselves from the sinner, this son of yours. Then the father says, no, your brother. And notice what, notice what the older son said. First of all, he gets angry. What does he say? All these years I've served you. 
notice, I've served you. And never once did I disobey your command. You see what level he's living on? He's not living as a son. He's living as a hired servant, precisely the very thing that the younger son says he deserves. The older son has been living all along. Look at the language. Disobey your commands? Really? What are you, a servant or a son? Never decide dis- disobey you. Uh, I, I served you. you know. Really, is that our relationship with God? A servant? I mean, some texts speak that way, but we got to graduate. Realize that we're beloved children in Christ. Live on that level. But of course, if we're not, if we, so everything's tit for tat, what I've earned or what my brother hasn't earned and how much I've served God and what my wages should be compared to the other people, well, come on. You don't know a thing about God. In fact, you're not behaving as a son at all. You are a hired servant. You don't understand the Father. You don't understand how the Father works. You never gave me so much as a, as a goat to make... F- make jolly with my friends. And the father says, notice the father doesn't get angry with him. That's not the father's way. It never is. Take note. My son, you know, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. Which he didn't know. The son obviously didn't realize that. But everything I have is yours. It's what Jesus says to his father in the, in the high priestly prayer. All your, everything that's yours is mine and mine is yours. That's the relationship of, son, of, of sons and daughters of God. Everything God has is ours already. But you needed to rejoice because this brother, your brother, who was dead has come to life again. He hasn't squandered his life anymore. He's come to life. He realizes the life he has. That's the pure gift of the Father, sharing in the Father's own life and substance and being. And he fully realizes that now. He was lost and is found. That's the amazing grace that we'll be singing about in just a few minutes. So th- th- that's what we need to understand, you know, how God treats us, you know, so that we can come, you know, simply in our poverty. Again, Richard Rohr expresses it very well and very boldly and bluntly when he says, puts it this way, we don't come to God by doing it right. We come to God by doing it wrong. Which sounds shocking to our, you know, moral, moral sensibilities, you know, our sense of justice, our sense of purity. But that this parable is proof. The older son did it right and didn't understand a thing. The younger son did it wrong and got it, understood the mercy as the recipient of that mercy. And Paul makes it clear in his teaching about the law that the law only makes us sinners. You know, the law doesn't give any blessing. You, know, you either become despair, uh, you either be despair or become a hypocrite if you just try and follow the law and think it's about keeping the law. You can't. You either become a Pharisee or a, or a hypocrite or both, you know, because you only get to God by doing it wrong. Why is that? Well, first of all, that's all we're capable of, but above all, because that's how we learn God's mercy. That's how we learn the dimensions of love. That's how we learn what love really is, which is this unconditional embrace of us just as we are. And that's what converts us. Then we're enthusiastic about God. We're in love with God. We're ready to embrace, embrace the whole world the way God does, the way, the way God has embraced us. You know, without counting costs, without counting who's worthy or who's not and who's moral and who's not. You know, that's just our own ego stuff going on. And if we apply that to God, it's blasphemous projection. It's not God. So if we do it wrong, we might finally get it be able to receive that mercy, undeserved, which is the way mercy and love always are. They're always undeserved. There wouldn't be love and mercy otherwise. And God is love. So let's open our hearts. If we realize this finally and receive this, then we really are a new creation, as the second reading says. 
We really taste the manna, the real manna that doesn't stop, according to the first reading. You know, we taste and see how good the Lord is. The finest of wheat, you know, we receive from the Lord, which is, you know, the Eucharist, this mercy, this great nourishment. And you could even say, you know, using Paul's second, second line there in the reading, that uh, the Father made Jesus to be sin so that in him we might have the righteousness of God. In a sense, you could all interpret the prodigal son as Jesus coming back to his father, laden with all the sins of the world. And what is the result? Embrace, kiss, you know, ring, robe, on all of us in Christ, so that in him we become the justice of God, which is the love of God. So it's, it's a revelation of who God really is and who we really are. So whenever we do it wrong, let's discover the mercy of God. We don't purposely do it wrong, but we're going to wind up doing it wrong. And then that finally may be the way we learn what God's love is and who, God's, who, God's, who God really is. Otherwise, we run the risk of being the elder son and missing the point entirely. Let's pray to be spared that.